Quiet, please. Quiet, please. Broadcasting System presents Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet, Please, for tonight is called Sketch for a Screenplay. I got to thinking this afternoon about Hollywood. There's a lot of people who don't care much about Hollywood, and I suppose they've got a right to feel any way they want to. But me... I always sort of liked the place. Not Hollywood the town especially, but what people in pictures think of as Hollywood. All the way out to Fox and Metro and the Selznick lot. All the way back to Paramount and RKO and Columbia. Out to the Valley to Universal and Warner and Republic. It's all Hollywood the picture people. Even Hollywood itself. I wonder if the loafers still clutter up the sidewalk outside the it on Vine Street. I wonder if the hardest working newsboy in the world is still on the corner of Hollywood and Vine. I wonder if Roland's still at the parking lot back of the Equitable. And that bartender at the Derby that always used to put the bite on you for 50 bucks. Hollywood Boulevard at Christmas time. Santa Claus Lane with the gold and silver trees and the lights. And in the summer, when it's 11 o'clock in Hollywood, but it's 3 o'clock in New York... That makes it time to have a bottle of Carta Blanc in the bamboo room. Yes, you get quite sentimental over Hollywood. Especially when you're not there. And you're not ever going back. I got to thinking about a screenplay this afternoon when I was thinking about Hollywood. No, it isn't written. I doubt it ever will be written. But I amused myself all afternoon thinking about it. Walking over to Harry's office with a batch of pages under my arm that Lillian had just typed up all nice and neat on the yellow paper. Maybe Milk Gross or Norman Foster would be strolling back to the writer's building, griping about changes their producer wanted, and bring it back at three o'clock, boys. Then Harry would be sitting there with his feet on the big desk drinking Coke. How many times? How many times? So sit down in a big easy chair with a light in your eyes. And after a while, Harry finishes his coke and takes his feet down and shuts his eyes. All right, what you got, Fred? Oh, I just got a few pages, Harry, just the opening of scene. Only a few scenes, but I think it sets the mood of the thing. Go ahead, let's hear it. Read it to me. All right. <clears throat> Long shot, the Chateau Park, summer, day. Shooting from a height toward the chateau itself, which stands at the edge of the woods where the low hills rise against the horizon. In the foreground, near a formal garden in the center of which a fountain plays, is a marble statue of a Greek goddess. And through the trees behind the chateau, we can dimly see other sculptured figures. The chateau itself is huge, gray, many windowed, and its conical turrets rise bravely against the. Okay, the... okay, everybody knows what a French chateau looks like. Go ahead with the story. <laughs> i got to go to the barbershop. A little breeze from the south moves restlessly through the branches of the trees and the haze of midsummer is on the distant hills. And over the scene comes the sound of children at play. Is this about kids? Kids? I suppose it is, Harry. I suppose it is. I remember those summers, those long, happy summers when I was a child. The park and the chateau were magic places then. And when the twilight fell across the broad woodlands and the tiny lights sprang up in the tall windows above us, we used to sit, the three of us, and dream of Bayard and Roland and Du Guesclin and all the paladins of France whose male ghosts were very near to us in the gathering dusk. Paul. And Roland blew his horn again and again, but the king was far away and he did not hear. And Madeleine. And Roland and all the army died in the pass of Roncevalles. Because King Charlemagne did not hear the horn of Roland. No, Madeleine. They died. 
but Roland didn't die. Well, the book says he died. No, Roland did not die. Did he, Frank? The colonel says he didn't die. The colonel says Roland lived forever. Where is he, then? Roland waits for the day when France needs him. Then he will come. And the colonel says if we listen on a night when there's no moon sometime, we can hear Roland sounding his horn. Maybe see the flash of his sword Durandal in the starlight. Oh, do you believe that, Fred? I don't know. Do you, Paul? No, of course I believe that. I have heard the horn. Oh, you dreamed it. I have heard it. It is nice to believe that. About the horn? About Roland living and being ready always to come to the aid of his people. I would like that. I would like to live always. Not forever, Paul. That wouldn't be fun. Yes, it would. To help people when they've given up hope. It would be fun that way, Fred. I don't want to live forever. Oh, I don't think anybody really wants to live forever. Uh, not even Roland, maybe. I remember that afternoon, the three of us under the great oak tree and the sun red and gold beyond the hills. Children together in the good days before the great plague came out of the east and swallowed up the youth and happiness of France. Is that all this thing's about, just kids? Scene 36, close three shot, Madeline, Paul, and Fred. I'm wearing my going away clothes and in my hand is my valise carefully tagged with my name and destination. It's a year later and more. The first chill winds of autumn are sweeping the leaves from the trees in the park and the frost has touched the flowers in the formal garden where we stand before the silent fountain. There are tears in Madeline's eyes and a suspicion of them on Paul's cheeks. For this is goodbye again. You will come back next year, won't you, Fred? Of course you'll come back, Madeline. Stop crying. Stop crying, you said. I am not. Fred, I miss you. You don't know how I'll miss you, Madeline. Paul. Why can't we keep you here always? My mother. You know. I wish you could stay. You'll come back, Madeline. Do come back, Fred. I will, Madeline. I promise. Go away, Paul. Go away? Please, Paul. Goodbye, Fred. Goodbye, Paul. Come back. I'll come back. We'll be waiting. I know. Till next summer, then. Till next summer. Fred, you won't forget us. Never, Madeline. We love you, Fred. And I love you, Madeline. Come back to us. I'll come back to you, Madeline. We'll wait, Fred. You wait for me? I'll be like Roland, Fred. No matter when you come back. A hundred years from now. I'll be waiting. And over the scene comes the sound of a distant horn. Not the distant horn of Roland protector of France with a strident horn of the motor car that was to take an American child away from the scenes of his happiest years and set him on his journey home. And as the two children embrace, wetting each other's faces with their tears, we fade up. And then I thought of the next few years. Fade in. New York Harbor and the Statue of Liberty dissolve to a confused, tearful greeting at the pier. Close up. A preoccupied, garrulous mother. And close up, an embarrassed, preoccupied stranger called father. And moving shot, a train streaking westward in the night. And montage, a sad-eyed boy staring out of a train window, a fountain playing in a formal garden in the sunlight. Cone-shaped towers against an evening sky. A girl waving goodbye from the iron gates of a chateau in France. A giant figure in armor brandishing a golden trumpet. And on the soundtrack, distant, distant voices. Come back, Fred. We love you, Fred. Come back. A hundred years from now. I'll be waiting, Fred. Let me see that script, Fred. Go ahead. Read it, Harry. Insert. Diploma from the University of Illinois. Know ye all men by these presents that Frederick Arthur, Bachelor of Arts, seal of the university... 
Full shot. City room. Daily newspaper. As Fred enters the room, the camera follows him to the desk of the city editor, where he stops respectfully. The camera moves into a close two-shot of Fred and the editor. The editor at last looks up. I was editor of the college paper my last year in school, and I did a column on sports for the Havana paper. Dissolved to typewriter and hands at work, the camera moves into a close close-up, and we read... By Frederick... Dissolve to close up. Fred at telephone. All right, Senator, I'll see what I can do about it. Dissolve to medium shot. Group at bar favoring Fred. Fred raises his glass and drinks. Here's to Hollywood, you unlucky people. Hollywood and a million dollars a week writing movies. Dissolve to close up. Fred's hands on a typewriter. Dissolve to full shot. Carthay Circle Theater at night. With searchlights stabbing up into the sky at the premiere of Fred's first picture success. Great crowds of movie fans in the bleachers as the stars leave their cars and parade into the theater. Fred in a brand new dinner jacket surrounded by picture personalities. Walks proudly into the theater. Insert the clock on the Utter McKinley building. Great brass pendulum swings back and forth relentlessly. Reminder of death and time. And the image of a girl waving goodbye is dim. And her voice far away. I love you, Fred. A hundred years from now, I'll be waiting. And an insert of the calendar that reads September 1939. And double exposed against it. Marching men in gray uniforms, Stukas dive-bombing a road, and a man in a rumpled gray uniform howling in a mob, and voices shouting, Zig Heil! Zig Heil! <laughs> Stock shot of the French tricolor being lowered. Newsreel shot of a man weeping in the street. Insert poster in the Hollywood office. The poster reads, Wanted for murder, Adolf Schickelgruber. Newsreel shot. Three men in uniform before the Arch of Triumph in Paris. One with a little mustache, a fat man, a club-footed man. And they're smiling. Double exposure. Superimpose the face of a weeping girl. And over the picture, the sound of a horn. Echoing from the pass of Roncevaux. And again, the face of a weeping girl beside a ruined, shell-torn chateau in France. And a word. One word. Waiting. Waiting. Now a stock shot of the studio gates closing from the outside and a quick montage of a raised hand of a train full of soldiers in new ill-fitting uniforms. A long line of men and a doctor with a needle. Marching men again and a tower and airplanes idling in a broad field. That was the old 501 at Lawson Field, the first of the airborne, the men who rode the storm. Bill Ryder and Bill Yarborough, first lieutenants, and Colonel Bill Lee and Bill Miley. Men with high jump boots and the curled-up wings of the paratrooper above the left blouse pocket. In the tower, and hanging face down in your harness and sweating out the ground. And jumping from the mock-ups and learning how to land. Endless hours packing parachutes. And nights across the state line of Phoenix City, beer and shooting galleries, and a shout of Geronimo when the MPs showed up with a pickup. Sweating out the ground on the first jump, a jump master's voice over the roar of the plane. Stand up! Hook on! Checking the shoe to the man next to you while the next man tried all the buckles, patted all the bulges on your pack. And the jump master again. Go! And a clatter of heavy jump boots on the metal floor and men flinging themselves into the green space outside and the sudden emptiness of the plane. And then your hands against the side of the door in a jerk that set you spinning. And then silence. And the plane scudding away. And the all-alone feeling with nothing to hold you up but a canopy over your head. No heaviness, no weight, nothing. Freedom. And then the green earth rushing up at you in a sudden vision... A girl's face in the blue above you. Waiting. And the ground in 
the chute, dragging you till you yanked the bottom shrouds and it fluttered down. Behind you, Bill Ryder yelling, Get out of that harness! You're infantry again! And the good feel of a tommy gun in your hands and the earth underfoot. And somewhere a horn calling you. And slowly, the scene fades out. Long shot. Port of embarkation. Staten Island. Night. An ice-covered ferry boat struggles across the blacked-out harbor to the end of the pier, and soldiers hurry up the gangplank to the dimly-lighted interior of the pier. A voice calls out a man's last name. He answers with his first name, and up the gangway to the bowels of the ship. Jump boots on the companionway ladders. Jump boots dangling from the upper tiers of the bunks. Lights, warmth, and great pots of coffee. Dissolve to... Long shot, convoy, day. A dozen ships wallowing in the bitter North Atlantic swell and a grim gray cruiser standing hardly in their wake. And a horn, sounding desperately across the heaving ocean. I sit in Harry's office as he reads the screenplay I dreamed of this afternoon. He looked up at last... But he doesn't see me in the easy chair with the light from the window in my eyes. I know what Harry sees. Harry sees the boy that looked like him. The happy, talkative kid that was Harry Jr. The boy that I last saw here in the office when he was talking about how USC was going to beat Notre Dame next Saturday. And I know what Harry's thinking of. He's thinking about a laughing, talkative young Marine corporal who made one too many landings with the Raiders. And the white star of David out there on that island with a name nobody can pronounce. And Harry turns back to the screenplay and reads silently for a little while. And then he looks at me. They won't go for war stories anymore, Fred. And I don't say anything for a second. But I think... Yes, they will go for war stories, Harry. Yes, there's still a lot of people that haven't forgotten. Go on. Read the screenplay, Harry. Long shot. An airfield in England. Night. Yes, I remember that. See, 47 as far as you could see. Clear night with the stars up there. Us in our jumpsuits, us with our Tommy guns and our knives and our grenades. Waiting. Close shot. Men loading an airplane. I remember that, too. I remember the floor of the plane cluttered with red packs of ammunition ready to dump out. They looked gray in the half light. And men with sweaty faces climbing aboard and sitting down in the bucket seat side by side like. Like people in the Wentworth Avenue streetcar, not speaking. Tightening their belts and sweating. Sweating out the takeoff. Medium shot. Control tower. I remember the green light flashing for the plane behind us as we passed the tower. Long shot. Formation of airplanes in flight. And high above more planes and more and more. And the sound of them was the sound of doom. And the contrails from the plains above stretching out white against the stars like a dozen Milky Ways. Medium shot. Interior. Airplane. Night. The men stand up in the darkness. Stand up. Hook on. Check equipment. And the green light goes on from the cockpit. And nobody yells, Your Honor, but out we go into the blackness below and night jump in wartime. And God knows what we'll find on the ground. Close up. Parrot trooper at door of plane. Close up with me as I brace my hands against the door jams. The darkness is sickening and heavy below me. The sweat leans on my face under the tight helmet. I feel for the bearing of my emergency chute. The man in front of me trips and goes out wrong. Somehow the static line holds he doesn't break free. The jump master slashes up the weapon with his knife and he's away. But when I jump, I'll be too far away from the rest, and the jump master yells at me to hold it, but he's too late. I'm imprisoned in the dark blackness between heaven and earth. 
alone. Alone in the dark and my heart bursting. I shouted in the darkness, but there was no answer. No answer but the muttering of the planes as they faded away into the night that wrapped itself around me like a cloak. And I gave myself up to die there in space. And I think I prayed. And I heard the sound of a horn blowing urgently. And I crashed through the branches of a tree and, and a greater blackness came over me. Dissolved to medium shot forest early dawn. From a tangle of underbrush, a man slowly rises to his feet. I got out of my parachute harness somehow. I was alone. And as I raised my head to reconnoiter. Close shot. German soldier. He lies half hidden behind a tree, and he is lowering his rifle after firing a shot. He waves to other soldiers off scene. Close shot. Paratrooper. The American throws himself behind a fallen tree. He peers anxiously through the bushes. Montage. German soldiers. In a series of short flashes, we observe German soldiers. Rifles and machine guns poised, completely surrounding the American. Close shot. The American. He looks out from his concealment, searching the area carefully. Suddenly, there is the crackle of a twig, and he leaps to his feet, his Tommy gun at the ready. Yes, of course, Harry. You guessed it. A young man and a young woman. Paul and Madeline. That's too much of a coincidence, Fred. It was Paul and Madeline. Where, Fred? We said we'd wait, Fred. They had not changed much. In rough living clothes, they looked a little older, a little thinner. And the cross of Lorraine on their coats told me what they were. We knew we would come back. Fred. Of course, old boy. What can I say to you? You, you might kiss me. And I kissed her. And her lips were cold as ice. There was warning in the enemy lay close to us, and perhaps. Oh, Fred, we have missed you so. We needed you, Fred. And Paul took my hand and smiled at me. You heard. I've heard it a great many times, Paul. You have not forgotten how we talked about Roland. No, I haven't forgotten it. How, how did you find me? Don't you recognize the place, Fred? I know. This is the woods behind the chateau where we all live. Well, I wouldn't have recognized it. Well, we played cowboy and Indians, Fred. Remember? I remember. Come, Fred. We have got to get you out of here. Well, but... The Germans... They can't hurt us, old boy. This is our home, don't you remember? Follow us, Fred, this way. Has it been rough? Yes. It has been rough, Fred. Come, Fred, we must hurry. Medium shot. The woods. With the three of us struggling through the thorny unkempt paths that once were clear and clean in the springtime. Paul ahead, then Madeline, then me. More and more pathways, some of them new, some of them mere traces of footprints through the woods. My two friends always ahead, always leading. You came back. Of course I came back, Madeline. We knew you wouldn't forget us. Come on, come on. Then I followed again. Twice I heard German patrols not too far away from us, but we went on and on till I'd lost all sense of direction. I said, how much farther? Paul stopped then. This is as far as we can go with you, Fred. But what... Well, what do I do now? You came back to us, Fred. You will know what to do. I well, know, but... Madeline. Come, Madeline. Goodbye, Fred. But, 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 Paul. Will I see you again? Yes. You will see us again. Oh, Fred. And Madeline kissed me. It was growing dark again, and the road that led past the chateau was directly in front of me. I knew my way from here. But Madeline kissed me in the twilight there. And again, I heard the distant call of the horn. And I turned away from her and went out. And she waved once when I looked back over my shoulder. And then 
she and Paul were gone. And I knew at last, Harry, why they couldn't go any farther with me. Read the next scene, Harry. Close shot. Clearing. Two graves with rude headboards. The camera moves in to a close-up and we read the inscription, Madeleine Duclos, French resistance fighter, executed by order of the German commandant. Paul Duclos, French resistance fighter, executed. You can't do that, Fred. There's one more scene, Harry. Camera moves up and over the two graves to a third. We read the inscription on this headboard. Private Fred Arthur, American parachutist. Killed in a single-handed attack on the headquarters of the German commandant. And over the scene comes the sound of children at play. Madeline and Paul and me. Listen to Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper. The man who spoke to you was Ernest Chappell. And Lada Stavisky was Madeline. Paul was Frank Thomas. Harry was played by James Monks. The original music for Quiet, Please, as usual, is composed and played by Albert Berman. Now, for a word about next week, here is our writer-director, Willis Cooper. My story for you next week is called Send and Not to Know, which is a quotation that you already know half of. If you don't know the rest of it, you will next week. And so, until next week at this time, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chappell. March is Red Cross time, the time when your American Red Cross asks your cooperation and support. The Red Cross has three major responsibilities this coming year. Disaster relief and rehabilitation, a national blood program so that the whole blood and its derivatives may eventually be made available free to all, and services to veterans and their families. But Red Cross services will not end there. You'll find the Red Cross lending a hand in building up health and ensuring the safety of the community, teaching simple bedside care, bringing the ways of good nutrition to expectant mothers, veterans' brides, the blind and the deaf, as well as others in the community, teaching how to give temporary relief to the injured, how to rescue a person from drowning, how to avoid accidents common in everyday experience. These are traditional Red Cross services offered in your name. Remember, in all it does, the Red Cross depends on you. Give generously and give to the 1948 Red Cross Fund. This program comes from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.